Okay. Um, so far, you know, we've done a, a pretty fair amount about HTML. Um, but if you observe a lot of stuff on the web, we see things that couldn't be done strictly just with HTML. And I'm going to start off by talking about a couple of them, and then we'll get into today's topic and talk about what part of the topic we're going to talk about and what part we're not going to talk about. So a couple of things. So let's go, let's go to Canvas. So I'm going to go and I'm going to log in to Canvas. And when I come to Canvas's page, first get asked for a login. All right. I type in my login and I type in my password. Click sign in. You'll notice that you all have done the same thing, I'm sure. You all have gone to canvas.learningccc.edu. But notice my page is going to look different than your page. My page contains the classes that I teach. So these are a list of the classes that I teach. A lot. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> now, yours is going to look different because yours is going to show you the list of the classes that you're taking. And if we poked around a little bit, we'd notice uh, some other differences. You know, I only see the messages sent to me. Right? So right now, I don't have any messages, which, um, again, I, I, think I, would, I think I answered most of my messages last night. So I didn't have any messages this morning. It shows me what I need to do. I need to do some grading on a few things. Shows me what's coming up in my classes. Your page is going to look roughly the same, all right, but it's going to look different, right? It's going to look similar, but different. For one thing, notice this says, this announcement is not visible to students. Um, I hope it's not any top secret information. I think it's just about the course evaluations. All right. Um, so and at any rate, um, it's just telling me about the evaluations that we can have performed. And it shows me my classes. Yours wouldn't show that announcement because that announcement's not available to students. And yours would show the classes that you're enrolled in. And what's more, what if we went into the classes and poked around a little bit, like I would be able to grade stuff, you would not be able to grade stuff. I would be able to see stuff that everyone turned in. You'd be able to see only the stuff that you've turned in. Yet we both go to the same website, canvas.lorraineccc.edu. All right. So anything that we studied about HTML now, uh, does it explain how this is possible? Right? Because the HTML that we have created so far has been what is known as static. The word static means not changing. All right? Which means that if you look at the first page that you turned in in this class, if you looked at it today, Provided you never changed it, it would look exactly the same as the day that you turned it in. All right? So if you wanted to change it, if you wanted to make it look different or add new content or something along those lines, you'd have to go in and manually change the code to add the new stuff in it. Whereas in this case, we have pages that look different without anyone making a coding change. In other words, if we both logged in right at the same instant in time, our pages would look different. We're viewing the same page, yet it's going to look different. And as you might imagine, there isn't someone sitting over somewhere in the Campana building, oh, Mike logged in, I better change the HTML to have his stuff on it. That just doesn't even make sense. It doesn't work. 
All right? Other examples. So that's not static, that's dynamic. Dynamic means when the page changes without someone changing the code. All right? Another good example of that is Google. If we go to Google and we search for something. So we search for HTML, for example. Notice that we're visiting the page, HTML, Google dot, HTTP, Google.com, search, question mark, and then we see some stuff afterwards. If I search for something else, I see the same thing up in the address bar. The URL, at least the part of the URL before the question mark, is the same. That means we're going to the same page, yet it looks different. The results look different. All right? So the, page, the, the contents of this page changed without someone making a coding change. You know, if you think about someone changing this page every time someone Googles something, that's ridiculous. You know, so many people are Googling stuff all at the same time. That couldn't possibly manually be changed. That doesn't even make sense. It's absurd. So therefore, this page has to be smart enough to know what you searched for and to change the content of the page without someone changing the code. So one piece of code has to be smart enough to accommodate anything a person might search for. Just like in Canvas, one piece of code must be smart enough to create the page for every individual that logs into Canvas. All right? You can't do that with HTML. Nothing that we've done in HTML suggests that that's even possible, to give totally different content to different users when they log in. Google actually gets even more, uh, more uh, how do I want to say it? Um, is even more sensitive to the user that's using it. If I were to Google, for example, restaurants, notice what I get. I get restaurants right around the college. All right, that's the map. Here's LC, and it shows me whatever that is. I think that's Panera, maybe? I don't know. I don't know what that is. No, that isn't. That is, I forget what it's called. But then it shows me Ruby Tuesdays, and it shows me Sugar Creek, and it shows me Sorrento's, and so on down the line. Ten best restaurants in Illyria. Illyria Midway Mall. Garden, or Olive Garden and so on down the line. Now, do you think if someone in New York City were to Google restaurants, they would get the same results? Of course not. They'd get the results of New York. All right? Again, the page that I went to here would be the same page that someone went to in New York, but it would give me different content. This, therefore, can't happen with plain old HTML. Something else has to be in play here for us to get these kind of results. We can think of a lot of other examples of this. If we go to a download page, if we're downloading software, the machine's liable to be, or the web server is liable to be smart enough to know that we are on a Windows machine and highlight the link for the Windows download instead of for the Mac download or the Linux download or so on. All right? If you do searches, Google's very intelligent. You know, that's why they made all that money, the, 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 the people that founded Google, because it did such a good job searching. If you search for something, it's smart enough to know what your previous searches were, and it will give you results that are similar to your previous searches. A classic example of that is... Here, I'm not logged in as me, and I don't use this machine regularly, so it doesn't know who I am and doesn't know my search history. But if I Google for Don Cherry, there are two people named Don Cherry, two famous people. One of them is a hockey announcer in Canada. 
One of them is a jazz trumpeter. Now, I'm more interested in music than I am in hockey. So if I were to Google this at home, I would get more results about the trumpet player and less results about the hockey announcer. Whereas someone that was a hockey fan would get the opposite. All right? Just because, uh, uh, you search Just because of your search history. It would be smart enough to know that you know, a hockey fan would have looked up uh, Wayne Gretzky and Bobby Orr and Gordie Howe and Gump Warmsley, who's my favorite hockey player. Uh, you got to like a guy whose first name is Gump. Uh, and yeah, let's look him up. He was, if I'm not mistaken, he was the last goalie to play without a mask. Now let that sink in. How fast does a hockey puck go? 100 miles an hour? Yeah, I was going to say, 100 miles an hour is not an exaggeration. And it's made of hard rubber. And they got a piece of metal inside, I think it is. I don't, I don't know, but yeah. Uh, the yeah. Here he is. The legend. That guy is crazy as hell. Yeah. Yeah. There he is, playing hockey without, or playing goalie without a mask. Uh, he was, I mean, that has to be rough. Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know if you want to say crazy or, or, or tough or whatever, but, you know, back then he didn't have the, the ability to do that, so. Oh, yeah, and they're the, like really old days, but then like people, then they like just, you know, they got the hard plastics or whatever is made of fiberglass to do that and guys started to wear them you know but he was like the last holdout to say yeah I don't need a mask my face is tough enough it can take the shots you know <laughs> so a anyhow anyhow what does oh well, I say well, how did I get on this track you know uh, oh I if I googled a lot of people like that I would get results about the hockey announcer but if I googled Thelonious Monk, John Coltrane, Duke Ellington, Count Basie I'd probably get results about the jazz musician so obviously the point is, is there's nothing that we've seen in HTML that hints that we could do anything like that. And there really isn't anything in HTML. So there has to be a different sort of technology that's used to do that. And that different technology is called server-side scripting, which we don't really cover in this class other than to introduce a concept. All right? Now, sometimes people say, well, if there's this thing called server-side scripting, why do we bother studying HTML? Because honestly, plain static web pages like the ones we've developed in this class are kind of rare. All right? Because no matter what, a website needs updated, right? Websites need updated constantly. There's very few uh, um, websites that you can make, put them out there, and leave them the same for a long period of time. Even something like Lorraine Community College's website. It always changes because there's news items, right? There's different events. A mortgage, uh, uh, not a mortgage, like uh, when people die. Uh, the obituaries. Yeah, that always stays the same because that's what they got. Oh, right, die right. Yeah, right, right. There's very few material. The only one I can think of, honestly, is like maybe a restaurant could put its menu up, put its location up, put some pictures of it. Still Even that is probably going to change because there might be specials yeah, or... if you go online like McDonald's, Burger King, blah, 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 all these restaurants, fast food restaurants, they always change it like once a month. Yeah, they always have uh, content changes and all that. And the whole thing is, with static websites, it's not that they can't change, it requires manual intervention to change. It requires someone actually changing the web page. So server-side scripting, we can do other things. Like we can put stuff in a database, for example. And that can create the new pages. Amazon would be another example of this. If we go to Amazon and we search for something, let's say we look for a Stephen King book. I don't know what 
what we want. The Shining, that's a good one. There's not a separate web page for every item out there. Notice that parts of this page is going to look the same as any other page. There's going to be this menu on the top, this navigation. And there's going to be a basic structure to it. Like, if we go to another page, there's going to be an image of the product. It doesn't matter what the product is. It could be looking for suitcases or duffel bags. I was looking for duffel bags. Still basically the same. The navigation on the top, picture, information about the product, information about buying it. That's the same as the Stephen King book. All right. So oftentimes there's a template of, that gets filled in with data from a database. That's a very common thing in uh, dynamic websites or server-side scripting websites. Now, people sometimes at this point look and say, well, why have we been talking about HTML if so few pages are written in HTML? And most of them are written via server-side scripting. Well, HTML is still the fundamental language of the web. It's how what web pages are written in. The difference between static HTML pages and dynamic HTML pages is who does the writing. All right? In the case of static HTML paging, the web developer does the writing. They create the HTML pages, just like you've done in this class. You create the tags and so on. For server-side scripting, the web developer doesn't write the HTML. The web developer writes a program that writes the HTML. All right? So you write instructions in a different language that dynamically creates HTML. Now, in order to do that, of course, you have to know how to write HTML yourself. Any of you that have done any sort of programming knows that in order to write a program to do something, you have to know how to do it, right? Uh, I couldn't write a blackjack program if I didn't know how to play blackjack, right? I have to know the rules of blackjack, and I have to know how it works and all that. Then I could write uh, a program that does it. Or calculating um, payroll taxes, right? Um, if I couldn't do it by hand, all right, I couldn't write a program to do it. Well, same idea here. You learn HTML sort of as a first step because if you continue along this line, you're going to know one of the next things that you might study will be to create server-side scripting, and that's to write programs that write web pages instead of writing the web page itself. Client, script, client server scripting class does some of that. It also does some server side, uh, it also does some client side scripting, which we'll talk about at the end of this course. So I'm going to draw a diagram up here that I draw in almost every class, and I draw it on almost every class um, um, several times. So I probably will do that several times this semester as well. The diagram looks like this. And I always use a fast food analogy with this. Here you have the client. And the client is the person sitting at a web browser that is Googling things, is checking their Facebook uh, feed, is bidding on things on eBay, looking for a restaurant to eat later in the day, whatever. So when I say the client, I mean someone that is using the web. In IT, when we talk about client server, the client is the entity that is using the application. The server is the one that's providing the service. So that's what we mean by client and server. It could be that way in a database system. It could be that way with email. It could be that way for web pages, databases. All right? Client is using the service. Server is providing the service. Put differently, a client makes requests. The server gives responses. And those words are important words. They're used all the time. 
So a client makes requests, the server provides responses. Now in the case of plain old static web pages, it's very simple. The client is connected to the internet, which as we know, oftentimes is represented by a cloud. Why do we represent the internet as a cloud? Yeah, we, we represent it as a cloud because there's a lot of stuff going on when I go and type in google.com. All right? It's not like there's a wire directly from Lorraine Community College to Google's headquarters, wherever that is, probably in California. All right? That request travels along a path of computers just like you would travel if you were driving from here to California. You'd follow a path of highways. In fact, people would, you know, back in the, in the good old days, people called the Internet the information superhighway. All right? Same idea here. We're going to take a path. If I were to type Google in my browser, we're going to take a path, and somehow we're going to end up on Google's web server. For the purpose of this discussion, we don't care what that path is. All right? We just care what happens at both ends of that transaction. The client making the request, the server responding to the request. So the details of how it gets there we're not interested in. All right? That's why we showed it as a cloud. Because, yeah, we go in, we come out the other end somehow. Now, we make a request. That request travels along some path, and it makes it to Google's web server, or whoever's web server. The web server does its thing and gives back response. Now, in the case of a very simple static website, there are sitting out here on the web server storages completed web pages. That is, web pages written in HTML with CSS, maybe some JavaScript, and so on. In the case of a static request, a request for a static page, the server's job is simply to grab those pages out of storage and deliver them as a response to the client. So if we had something like a static page for a restaurant, a small mom and pop restaurant that never changed their menu, never changed their hours, never changed their location, we would go to that site, request their web page. That web page could be done as a static HTML page. The web server would only gather the completed pages and deliver them to us, the client. So we'd get back HTML, CSS, and maybe some JavaScript. We haven't talked about JavaScript yet. We might get some back. And that response would be, and our web browser would then view that page. Let me look. Let me look for a small mom and pop restaurant. We'll look for the Blue Sky restaurant. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Two locations. That doesn't change, at least not very often. Menu, there's a breakfast menu, specials, every Monday they have the same special, right? Every Tuesday they have the same special, and so on down the line. 
Notice these pages are Monday.html, Tuesday.html, Wednesday.html, Home.html. This is a static website. Nothing wrong for it, per se, because that's all a small mom-and-pop restaurant would probably need. They don't change their menu very often. They don't change their specials very often. They can create this website in static HTML, put it out there, and people can access it. So in the case of a static website like this, all right, again, not saying that there aren't any in the world. Sometimes that's all that is needed. You know, so one of the rules of web development is, you know, you solve the problem that's put in front of you. So sometimes a plain old HTML site is all that an organization would need. And in a case like this, you have that. All right. In a case like this, the web server's job is really easy. Here's the Blue Sky restaurant I forgot to go to. the camera. Static, unchanging pages. You know what? This probably would be because it's simple enough to where not bad. All right. You don't really need to, you know, um, this, you know, this site isn't like a amazing, dazzling site and all that, but you know what? It gets the job done. Mobile compatible, you know. This is how it would look like on a Galaxy S5. I'm thinking I could read that. All right. So, not bad. In the case of a static web page, all the web server does when you make a request is it finds your request amongst all the completed web page, it grabs and it sends it down the line. All right? Just sends it to you. That is a lot like what McDonald's does, right? Not their website, but actual McDonald's, right? You go in and order. If you go in and order a Big Mac, what do they do? Do they have a chef in the back saying, oh, this person wants a Big Mac. Let me fire up the grill and make one. Sure. No, yeah, right, right. No, during the lunch rush, for example, they would have a bin full of Big Macs that were already finished. All the server would do when you go in there and ask for a Big Mac is turn around, grab the Big Mac, and throw it in your bag. There you go. Boom. All right. Now, compare that with Subway. Why can McDonald's do that, but Subway can't? You go to Subway, every, if you're not, you know, we should take a field trip down to the Subway uh, one of these days, right? How does it work at Subway? Well, you could have a hundred different combinations each person could make, so that would be very hard to have it pre-prepared. Exactly. It would be very difficult for Subway to have a list of pre-prepared subs up there. Well, they're really good at getting it. Well, yeah, exactly. All right? So... For example, let's just talk about a turkey sub. Real simple, right? There would be a turkey sub versus a turkey sub toasted. That's two options. Now, for each of these, you could have the sub with provolone, American, pepper jack, whatever kind of cheese it has. So let's say there's four cheeses. We're at eight options now. All right? You could add guacamole or not. 16 options. You could add bacon or not. That is uh, now 32 options. With mayonnaise or chipotle sauce or Caesar dressing or trying to remember, I eat there almost every day. I should have all these down, right? <laughs> Very quickly, you're going to get into hundreds, thousands, maybe even more possibilities. And that's just for a turkey sub. Then it's like, okay, what about uh, a spicy Italian? Same thing, with onions, without onions, with hot peppers, with uh, banana peppers, with olives. There are so many options that there's no way that they could stock all of them. Oh, what was that? You wanted a turkey with guacamole and bacon and mayonnaise? 
Let me see, let me find that here amongst the 15 million other sandwiches in the back. You just couldn't do it. Just like Google couldn't have a page for everything that someone might search for. It's ridiculous to think about that, you know. It doesn't even make sense. Or Amazon's not going to have a separate web page for every product they sell. All right? Or Canvas isn't going to have a separate page for every student here on campus. Instead, there's a recipe. There are instructions that the server is given on how to make a student web page, a Google search web page, a eBay web page, a Facebook web page, and so on. All right? Just like there's instructions on how to make a sandwich, right? There's a recipe that you go through. Find out what kind of bread, 6 inch or 12 inch, toasted or not toasted. What's a sandwich? Then you put the meat on it. What kind of, do you want cheese? Do you want other stuff? Do you want vegetables? And so on. There's instructions that the server goes through to make you a sandwich right there on the spot. All right? Based on your input. So there's two things coming into play. There's instructions that the server already knows in their head. And there's the input from you about what you want. So in that case, with dynamic pages, you don't have completed web pages. You have scripts or programs, which are like a recipe. Instructions of how to do that. When a request comes in, it contains a couple things. It contains the URL of the page. It's going to have, regardless if it's a static or dynamic page, you're requesting a certain page from the internet. It might have input values. In other words, if I go and search at Google, doesn't read my mind as to what I want to search for, I can enter in what I search for. If I go to Canvas or Facebook, I enter in my user ID and password. All these things are sort of user options or user choices, just like whether you want wheat bread or white bread or toasted or not toasted provolone or American cheese are options that you give, are input that you give the server in making your sandwich. So you get the input from the user. That input from the user is used by these scripts to dynamically on the fly, create either a sandwich, if we're talking about Subway, or a web page, if we're talking about dynamic servers. All right? So Google takes a term that I put in there. It uses its script. It probably looks up some information in the database somewhere. for your request. That's amazing when you think about it, right? Every time you go to Google, the web page is made for your request. Every time you log into Canvas, every time you go to Facebook or check eBay. But if you think about it, <coughs> it couldn't work any other way, right? eBay wants to show you the current price. So it has to look up the price that second when you make a request to tell you what the bid is on a particular item. All right. That, in a nutshell, is the difference between static HTML pages and server-side pages. All right. Server-side pages can take input and any number of other factors and create a page for the client on the fly. That means it can be up to date. I don't, no one has to change the script. 
you would just have to change the database in this case. All right, so if new items are put in the database for Amazon, they automatically show up on the web page. All right, if new websites are created, when Google's database gets updated, boom, they will, they'll start appearing on searches and so on. So in the case of a static page, the web pages are already done and they simply get delivered to the client by the server. The request is for a web page, they find a web page and they deliver it. In the case of a dynamic page, the web page and some input from the user is likely sent to the server and then does some processing, maybe reads a database and creates a web page on the fly for the client. Now here's the critical thing, all right? When you go to McDonald's or when you go to Subway, in either case, when you're done, what does the server deliver to you? A sandwich, all right? Well, maybe a sloppy sandwich, maybe a not very nutritious sandwich, but it's a sandwich, all right? Doesn't matter which of the two places you go to. Doesn't matter if the web page is created statically or dynamically. What you as a client get back is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Another way to put it is you can't eat a recipe. So if you request a dynamic page, you're not getting back to server-side script. That's just instructions on how to make a web page. You get back the output from those instructions. You get back the actual web page. Now, there's other things that could go into a request, too. For example, obviously from the Google search, we can see that your location can come across in a Google search. So there, one of the things that gets sent to the server is your location. Not really your location, but your IP address, which a web can use to figure out the location. All right? The platform you're on. Are you on a mobile device or a desktop device? Are you... Um, using Windows or Linux or Mac operating system. And then again, things like your search history, who you are, your user ID, so it can use your search history. We're going to focus on this. How we can get HTML, using HTML, how we can get user input. server side to process it. We can create the input in HTML that gets sent to the server and the server can do the processing of it. We're not focused on the server side scripting. We're just introducing you that concept and um, but we're not going to write any server side scripting. Now what language do we have server-side scripting? What language does this? Because it's not HTML. It's a language that creates the HTML. Well, that would be some of the things that just mentioned. Python is one possibility. PHP. Uh, Java, JavaScript. Perl. Sometimes some JavaScript can be used. How about uh, Ruby on Rails? Ruby on Rails. ASP.NET, Java Servlets, SQL, that is specifically for the database interaction, oh, okay. but that can play actually with all of these. All of these can use SQL to do that. The point is, is that there's more than one way to do this, all right? There's more than one way to take a user request and create a custom web page. And we're not talking about any, any of them in this class, all right? We're just introducing the concept to you. All of these do the same thing now. They take a request and create HTML. It's just a matter of writing it. So we're not writing web pages. We're writing web pages to write web pages, 
We're writing code programs to write web pages. But in order for it to work, one of the main ingredients that we need is the input from the user. So I'm going to start out by reverse engineering a Google search. All right? I'm going to create a web page that does my own Google search, which means that I'm going to use the Google server to actually do the server-side scripting part. I'm going to use my own HTML, though, to form the request and send it to Google. All right? And this is OK. This isn't like I'm doing it without their permission or whatever. They allow you to do this. They could block this if they wanted to. Because we're using the service. Exactly. Exactly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little reverse engineering. I'm going to look at this. And we're going to, we're going to dissect this URL. All right? And because I, you know, because I know how URLs work, we're going to look at some parts of it and we're going to ignore other parts of it. I'm going to pick out the parts that are relevant. Here's the URL. All right. Everything up to, whoops, everything from the beginning up to the question mark is the URL itself, all right? I mean, it's the main part of the URL. I, there might be a name for it, but um, the whole thing is the URL. But everything up to the question mark is like the main part of the URL. Now, HTTPS is the protocol that's being used, all right? Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. The colon is a colon. The two backslashes say that we're going to start at the root of this domain, www.google.com, the domain. That's where that relates to a web server. So this is the web server that we're accessing. Slash search is the name of the script that we're calling on the other end. Now, that might be an alias for the script or whatever. I'm not going to get into the details of that. But we can think of that as being the name of the script that we're going to call. So we're going to call the search script on the Google web server. The script is called search. That's the URL that we're calling. That's the page that we're calling. Now, after the question mark is a bunch of additional data and we're going to ignore a lot of it. But the part that we're not going to pay attention to is this Q equals HTML. The question mark indicates the start of the query string. After the query string are data that the client is sending to the server. And of this, the most important part is Q equals HTML. I'm going to go and I'm going to simplify this URL. To only the parts we need. Now again, I've done this a million times, so you kind of have to trust me on this. After the question mark, is what's called the query string. And the query string is information that the client is sending the server, oftentimes coming from a form. All right? So we did a Google search on HTML. That's what it looks like. Let's do a Google search on CSS. Notice how everything in the URL looks the same except the Q, Q equals CSS. So that's sort of how I figured out that, well, that's what they call the thing that you're searching for. The query is Q. So everything in the query string 
is a ordered pair of things. There's the name of a field and the value of the field. So in this case, Q equals HTML. Q is the name, HTML is the value. So as long as we supply the script, the name and the value that we're searching for, and we call it by the name that it's expecting, that is Q, all right, then we should be able to write our own code that does its own Google search. All right? So we're going to do that. If there were additional items on the query string, they'd be separated by no, an ampersand. Lang equals en, for example. All right? Might be something like that. The plus is actually a replacement for a space because if there's a space in the middle of a URL, that messes things up. So they replace any, they quote, encode a URL, and that would involve converting some characters, one of which would be the space they convert to a plus. Okay, so let's go and do this. We have less than five minutes. It might take five minutes, but we'll get this done today. No, nah, we'll, we'll, we'll do this within 10 minutes anyhow. So let's go in here and let's make a web page. Do pay attention to have all the right tags in it. I know sometimes your page works if you don't, but it's good practice to, for example, have a head and a body section and that you have all your ending tags and properly nested and so on. First thing we're going to have in here is a form tag. Think of the form tag as being an envelope that you're going to put a message to the web server in. All right. That message that you're sending to the server is your request. Method is get. Get means use the query string. That's what we want to do. And we'll talk more about the get next time. Action equals the name of the script we want to call on the other end. And that's what I copied and pasted from the address bar. It's the action is the URL up to the up to the dollar sign uh, up to the question mark. All right. You don't have to put the question mark. Don't have to put the question mark. So I want to call this script https colon slash slash www.google.com slash search. And I want to pass my data in the query string. Almost there. Input. It's a user input. Type equals text. It's a plain old text box where you can type information in. Name equals Q. Did I just make up name equals Q? No. no. That's what I observed that the search field was called on the query string. So I have to match what the server is expecting. Now in this case, Google wrote this, so I have to match what they expect. If I was a coder, if I coded the script on the other end, then I would have made the script and I'm making this so I would know what I chose. But here, I have to use the name that the server picked. All right? Then we need a button to actually send it to the server. So I'm going to say input type equals submit value equals 
search. That's going to be the name on the button. Name equals button submit. All right. Think that's correct? Let's try it out. Let's save it. We will call it. form.html. Let me save it on the desktop. Now when we run this, we get text box so I can type something in. Search button. Alright, that's the submit button. And when I type something in, I hit search. There it went and did a Google search for us. All right. Now if we notice our URL doesn't look exactly the same. We omitted some of the extra stuff that it had. Who knows what some of that extra stuff may means? I don't know. We could probably make some guesses if we studied it for a while. We also have some extra stuff. We have BTN submit. That's the name of our submit button. All right. Yeah, we can Google it, right? Exactly. But apparently all the Google script needs is something called Q that contains our search uh, criteria. And it will go and do the search. All right? So we've done half the job for Google. We've gathered up information that we're going to send to Google to do its thing. Well, this is using the Google uh, search. There are other ways that you can embed a Google search on your site. For example, there are more extensive ways. For example, I believe if you do a search on LC's website, you're actually using Google. Now, um, it will, uh, it probably will say somewhere that it's a Google search, though. Like if we search for web development. That probably actually did a Google search. And they probably allow you to do it that way. Yeah. Yeah. There's actually a way that you can do that, even if you just do Google. Like, we could do that here. If we say web development site lorraineccc.edu, didn't do it with the ads, but all of the sites that it returns are lorraineccc.edu. That comes in handy, by the way, if you're ever, ever Googling. You know, if you want to uh, look up something, but you know, um, yeah, yeah. If you if you want to do a search for Mustang, for example, I don't know. They still make Ford Mustangs. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. If I wanted to search for Mustang, but I didn't want to get like about the horse or about the sports team or something like that, I could say Mustang site equals Ford dot com and I could get just stuff about the Mustang. Which one do you want? <laughs> I like this one. I like the, what would you call that, gold or mustard? or Yeah, I like that one. I like anyone to be free. <laughs> yeah, I, the, exactly. That's like, what's your favorite car, one that's paid off, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm paying my car. I'm going to drive my car until it literally just forms a pile of dust in my driveway. You know, if, there, if there's anything more solid to it, I, I'm not, not going to trade it in or anything. Okay, we're going to build on this next time, because obviously we just did the one thing here. Uh, and we will uh, we'll build on it, and we'll add some other functionality to it. Uh,
But again, the idea is that we're gathering up the input and we're sending it as part of the request to the server. The server then takes our input and runs a program on it, runs instructions, interacts with the database, and prepares a result just for us. Okay, we'll see you up in lab.